he's just going to pull up the first line. Great. I'm going to wait. You're not quite ready yet? I'm ready whenever you want. We are. Great. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, next presentation at the Book Festival. As I'm sure you all know, the festival is free, but um, any donations are always uh, kindly accepted at the info tent, where there are many fabulous items for purchase that you all know you really need. Um, this talk will be uh, introduced by Jeremy Hobson, the co-host of NPR's Here and Now. Uh, and uh, with no further ado, as we're a little behind schedule, we welcome Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks to the English side of my family, I'm glad that we have some time inside in the shade for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. <laughs> Um, I'm here representing WBUR today, which is really proud to be a sponsor uh, of the Book Festival, and I have the pleasure of introducing David R. Foster, who's been a faculty member in or organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard since 1983, and director of the Harvard Forest, which is the university's 4,000-acre ecological laboratory and classroom in central Massachusetts since 1990. David is the principal investigator for the Harvard Forest Long-Term Ecological Research Program, which involves more than 100 scientists and students investigating the dynamics of New England landscape as a consequence of climate change, human activity, and natural disturbance. He's the author of a number of books, including Thoreau's Country, Journey Through a Transformed Landscape, New England Forest Through Time, Wildlands and Woodlands, a vision for the New England landscape, and the book he's going to talk about today, which is A Meeting of Land and Sea, Nature and the Future of Martha's Vineyard, about which David McCullough writes, David R. Foster has given us not only a different way of looking at the landscape and history of Martha's Vineyard, but at history and our human settings overall, and the inevitable influences of the past on the future. All in all, with its superb maps and marvelous photographs, a meeting of land and sea is a stunning achievement. Please welcome David R. Foster. Well, thanks so much for um, being here. I'm here because I love this landscape, and I'm keen to understand it as well as I can and to help as much as I can shape it in effective and ecologically sensitive ways into the future. So this is a book which tries to answer the question, what is Martha's Vineyard? How did it come to be? What forces have shaped it? And how can we use that information to guide it into a future which resonates well with its past. At the same time, Martha's Vineyard provides a microcosm for many challenges that are facing a much bigger land mass, North America and the globe. And so I try to address the issues on Martha's Vineyard in a way that they will provide some reflection on these broader issues and some, some general guidance for the ways that we can use an understanding of history and ecology to conserve New England and the rest of the United States and broader parts of the globe. So the premise of the book and the approach that I take is that every landscape has a history. And that history reveals the forces and processes that have shaped it over time. I and mean, if we look at Chilmark, we see the looming mass of the glacial moraine behind that has been exposed ice-free for some 20,000 years. And in the foreground, we see the 19th century remnants of the brickyard. If we go into the landscape across the vineyard, we see 
trees which clearly have a history and reflect an unusual set of processes that are different than most of the trees that we see elsewhere. In fact, these particular trees are shaped by the conditions of the landscape really in the 19th century and early 20th century that are disappearing on the vineyard. And so this form of tree is actually a relic of the past. And if you look beyond it, you see trees that are straight and will become tall, will grow over this one. So the vineyard is still changing, and yet it retains these elements from the past. And so as we go around the vineyard, we can ask the question of what do we have today and how is it going to change into the future? This is a view off near Squibnocket Pond on part of Redgate Farm, looking at relict, relict sand dunes that are still partially active, but not as active as they were 50 or 100 years ago. So in order to put this book together, and essentially every chapter has both a compilation of historical information and information that is out there in the literature and learned through talking to people, and a lot of new research that we've conducted, as shown here by, for example, taking tree ring cores to determine the age and changing growth of, of trees. This is actually a course that we bring out here every year of freshmen who go, in this particular case, to West Chop Woods. We explore the landscape in other ways. Here we are on a small pond near Squibnocket Pond where we're coring the mud in the bottom of the pond to reconstruct the history of climate change and vegetation change and impacts of humans um, over the last 10 to 15,000 years. We weave in, and I try to weave in, the insights that come from archaeology. Here, a group from Harvard and UMass who are working on the top of Lucy Vincent, the hill at Lucy Vincent Beach, actually working on a section of that knoll that no longer exists. And of course, the vineyard has a phenomenal archival record of history that has come both from the Where's my AV guy? <laughs> there he is. Yeah, it's connected. On the screen? It's on the computer. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll leave my hands away. Uh, these archives are phenomenal. The two greatest sets of archives at the vineyard, I mean, there are tremendous archives in the basements, the attics, and on the shelves of many of the houses on the vineyard. But the two greatest archives are the Martha's Vineyard Museum and the Vineyard Gazette, but also the libraries and all. So hours in there to determine things that have happened in the last three or 400 years. So the first thing we do is recognize the phenomenal diversity of the towns and the landscapes on the vineyard. The fact that we can find ancient woodlands that have persisted on these sites for 10,000 or more years. This is a view going up, up through Chilmark, up over the moraine on Meeting House Road. We can see the farm landscape and the sites that have been in agriculture for hundreds of years. Here looking over Allen Keys fields and pond off towards the south shore. We can recognize the variation of the individual towns. Edgartown, the oldest town, the oldest harbor, and its majestic houses and sweeping shorelines. And then the kind of more pressing and honky-tonk nature of Oak Bluffs, um, really the, the newest form towns. And then the dynamics of the landscape. Here looking off across one of the ponds that's been breached in the south shore, a fisherman enjoying a day by himself while 
dealing with the wind and the surf that continue to shape the landscape. So let me just highlight a few of the processes and a few of the surprises that come out of looking at the vineyard, both past and present. The first is to recognize that the vineyard is forever getting smaller. Its fate is to disappear. It's eroding at a remarkably fast rate. This was an extraordinary period when oak forests were falling into the ocean off of Waisqui at a time when the ro rates of erosion were as great as they have ever been. But we've compiled a set of maps to give a sense of how the landscape has changed. 22,000 years ago in the upper left, when you could stand on what is now the South Shore and look 50 miles to the south and see land extending outward. So Martha's Vineyard was deposited by the ice, as was Nantucket, on the land. And so they were insignificant bumps in what was a vast coastal plain. It's only in the last 5,000 years that Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket became separated from the mainland and it persisted as islands, first as one and then as separate. This coastal shift, this coastal erosion and the northward movement of the South Shore is evident even on historical maps. So this fabulous set of maps on the left produced by Henry Whiting first in 1846, showing that if we come forward to the recent times, we can see that the average rate of erosion in that part of the South Shore is seven feet a year. So a geological process that's operating at a rate that we can actually observe year to year and certainly over a decade or more that we spend time on the island. So we've compiled a map that shows this variation in erosion, very little in the North Shore and off to the West towards Vineyard Sound, a little bit more on the East Shore that's more exposed towards Nantucket Sound, and these very rapid rates that go up to 10 feet or more on the South Shore. So another surprise to many people, especially people who've been on the island for a long time and know how open it is and how open it has been in the past. If you arrived here 100 years ago, or even 25 or 30 years ago, the impression would have been that vast parts of the island should be open, should, are just kind of permanently open as grasslands, as shrublands, as heathlands, as Aquinnah was certainly 30 or 40 years ago. Martha's Vineyard, like all of New England and these coastal islands, were originally forested up until the time of European arrival. And so this is a painting which is Beardstadt's attempt to reconstruct the description by Gosnold. And all the research that we've done with all these corings of ponds and lakes shows that up until the arrival of European people 400 or so years ago, all you see in these sediments is evidence of a forested landscape. No grass, no weeds, no pollen of cultivars of plants that would have been raised to feed people. Instead, there would have been remarkable forests, old forests. Now, this is a picture on the left of West Chop Woods, where the pitch pine trees are upwards of 200 years old and getting older and going back to a condition that would have been similar to what would have happened in pine forest four or 500 years ago. And on the right, we have a picture from the moraine of a old beech forest, and beech and oak and hickory. Again, some of the diversity of the landscape, but also an impression of forests that might be uncommon today, but are getting more and more common as the vineyard is reverting to, in many places, a more natural condition. And so it turns out that one of the big surprises from all the archaeological work in, on the vineyard, on Nantucket, across New England in general, is that in contrast to some earlier interpretations of an open landscape maintained in an open condition and oftentimes in a planted and agricultural condition by native people, through the use of fire and other processes, 
These areas were actually dominated by forest. And in fact, the native people were not agriculturalists. They did have a bit of corn, they did have some beans, and they had squash, the three sisters. But they didn't use them for a subsistence. In fact, they were hunter, gatherers, collectors. And 3,000 or more people lived across the island, as we can see from the names that have been continued and morphed over time into the names that we still have for various parts of the island. But if we look at the concentration of activity and the concentration of remains by people, they're all focused into areas where there are abundant resources associated with the confluence of water, wetlands, and uplands. These were an adaptable people who could use the rich resources that came from the sea, from fresh water, from streams, from upland forests, both plant and animal, and all these environments to support themselves. Now, there are lots of other processes that shape the landscape as well. One of the ones that we don't give too much thought to today because we haven't had a significant one in quite a while is hurricanes. And these show the tracks of all of the major hurricanes that have affected Martha's Vineyard since the arrival of Gosnold in 1607. So a significant number of storms. They're color-coded here. Green and light is, uh, or blue and light is, is uh, weak storms, relatively weak storms, and the red is stronger storms. Now these significant storms can be, have quite an effect, as these renditions of Menemsha show before, on the top and after, on the bottom, the 1938 hurricane. This from a surge that came through Menemsha Pond and wiped out all these buildings. But the surprise is that if we look at all of the historical storms, the ones that we've had recently, and the most recent really major one was Hurricane Bob, and even the ones back through the 19th century and the 18th century pale in comparison to the magnificent early colonial hurricane of 1635. And so, as we think of the vineyard going forward, and as we think of more houses, and as we think of more and bigger forest, we have to think of the kinds of impacts, the kinds of disturbance that the next storm is going to have, especially if it starts to rival this one from 1635. And so just as an example, this is an old growth forest that was, a, that was actually much closer to the eye of the 1938 hurricane, which did have the wind speeds in that region of what we would expect from a 1635 storm. And that entire old growth forest was laid flat by that storm. But when we think of processes that have shaped the island and give it the character that we have today, in addition to the natural ones that I've talked about, it really is the direct impacts of people which have had some of the most significant effects and will certainly guide the future of the island going forward. If we look back historically, and these are graphs that show changes in all of New England. Each of these lines is one of the New England states. And it shows basically a history of deforestation to the middle 19th century, deforestation for agriculture, with of course wood use for heating and building. And then a remarkable resurgence of forest as agriculture shifted to other parts of, of North America, to the Midwest and the West, and good transportation was allowed us to import materials. And that meant that agriculture declined and Agriculture declined and forests came back on all the old farmland. Let's see if we can orchestrate this together.
Okay. So an example of what this would have looked like is two photographs from essentially our backyard at the Harvard Forest of an agrarian landscape that's beginning to fill up with bushes as fields are being abandoned. And then that same landscape today where everything that was agriculture is now forested. Well, the same thing is true in the vineyard. The map on the upper left shows, comes from this absolutely remarkable survey that Henry Whiting uh, conducted in the mid 19th century. The green shows the remnants of woodlands in the vineyard at that time relatively small, confined essentially to the state forest, and then arms going off in a variety of directions. And down at the bottom right, everything that is green is forest, with the light green representing the forest that's come back on old farmland. But on the bottom map, we also notice this kind of pink or lavender color, and that's settlement. Those are houses and development. And so going forward, it is going to be that interplay between agriculture and forest and agriculture, forest, and development that will determine the fate of the vineyard. Now, if we look across New England, we can see that we're sacrificing both forest land and agricultural land at a remarkable rate. 24,000 acres a year are being converted to development or pavement, commercial buildings, and so on. And when we look out across New England for the greatest example, one of the most perfect examples of the perforation of a natural ecosystem by housing, it's found right here in Oak Plus, which is that photograph on the bottom right. So our landscape, our natural landscape, and some of our most productive landscape in terms of agriculture are being filled with development, but even in remote areas, and even in areas of vast natural landscapes, in some of those, a single house can have a major impact. So this is a house being built on the south shore in an immense area of ancient woodlands, a stretch of the vineyard that has been in forest for thousands of years. So we're in a very interesting time, a really precarious time, in New England history and in vineyard history. We have a record of some of the greatest conservation achievements in the world. There are more land trusts, more conservation organizations, more focus on this stuff in this region than anywhere else. The vineyard is 40% conserved. New England is more than 20% conserved. And yet if we look at those areas, we can see that each of them is vulnerable to infill by development. And here we see at the eastern edge of the state forest, north of the state forest, west of the state forest, closing in from all directions is houses. And so if we're satisfied with 20% in New England or 40% on the vineyard, we're going to end up with isolated little blocks of, of conservation land surrounded densely by houses. So starting in 2005, a group of us put together a vision for first Massachusetts and then New England. And this year, we're coming out with a third report, which actually looks back and says, well, what have we achieved recently in terms of conservation? Where are we headed and how do we spur it on even faster? And we came up with a vision, which is actually a very plausible vision for all of New England. And in a sense, we would challenge Martha's Vineyard to come up with a similar vision. Today on Martha's Vineyard, 40% is conserved, 30% is developed, and 30% is what people tend to call up for grabs. And so there's this play going on. Well, we propose that for New England, we could conserve 70% of the region, which is now 80% forested, 70% in forest, and conserve the existing agricultural land. And one of the great ways to achieve that is by bringing all of these remarkable land trusts and conservation organizations together in regional partnerships that can work on land protection in a concerted way that's very efficient, attracts great resources and energy, and also reaches out and works with individual landowners to help them conserve their land. 
Well, over the last 12 years since this vision was first raised, a total of more than 40 of these regional conservation partnerships have formed. And there is a regional conservation partnership here on the island, and there's an opportunity for it to work even more effectively than it has in the past. Now the great force of land protection and conservation on Martha's Vineyard today is the land bank, the Martha's Vineyard Land Bank. And you can see these two lines. One shows the rate of land protection, consistent adding of conservation lands over time. The other shows the income that comes from the 2% tax that is on real estate transactions. Almost $200 million have been invested, and that will continue into the future. But there's more that we can do. We can protect more land. We can work more efficiently at a town and at a commission, Martha's Vineyard Commission level across the island to plan and develop more efficiently. And we as individual landowners and as stewards of the vineyard can take care of our own land even better. But ultimately, across the eastern US, across New England, across Martha's Vineyard, the future, even when we are informed by great history and great science, will always come back to each of us individually, whether we're a landowner or a participant in a land trust or just a visitor who puts a little something into helping to steer the vineyard into a wise future direction that honors the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You've helped us all appreciate what our responsibilities are living here. David's available for some questions now. And of course, his book is uh, available for purchase on the, in the back. After, he will be at the signing tent uh, also. I would ask people who have questions to please come up to the microphone. We have so a microphone well. for questions. Don't be shy if you have any questions. No questions. Right. Well, I guess everybody is committed to going out and conserving Martha's Vineyard, so that is good. I am sorry. No, please. Go ahead. All right. No, I just had a simple question. I was very um, compelled by your expression of land change in a single tree and about the shape. Right. form of a tree changing over time. I wondered if you would unpack that for us a little sure. bit. Sure. So the vineyard is filled with, with relics. We've got um, archaeological relics. We've got chimneys, which are relics. We have trees, which are relics. They're relics of an environment that no longer exists on the vineyard or is disappearing on the vineyard. And these widespread trees that we see if we take the hike through the Menemsha Hills, or in that particular case that was taken down at Quan Su um, in the wonderful Loop Trail on Sheriff's Meadow and Land Bank property. Um, those are trees that grew up when the vineyard was in its early post-agricultural period. It was wide open, and so individual trees were shaped by hard winds, salt spray, ice during the winter, and so they grew horizontally under open conditions and in a way to keep their, their limbs protected. Today, when the landscape is becoming more and more forested, individual trees are grown up in the, in the protection of, in the lee of other trees, in the protection of woods, and so they'll grow tall and straight just like they do in most woods anywhere in the United States. Hi. Could you comment on what's going on with uh, West Tisbury, um, the, the oak trees that died in West Tisbury a few years ago, and then the regeneration and what the work is that you're doing? Sure. So uh, there have been uh, 
these past couple of years, or in this year, there have been gypsy moth outbreaks. Um, in um, the late 2000s, there were a series of outbreaks of caterpillars that defoliated the trees in essentially the ridge that lies between North Road and, and State Road. Um, Poly Hill Arboretum, West Coastum's Rock, up over into Seven Gates, um, onto the Woods Preserve, and so on. Uh, there were three years of defoliation. In the third year, as the trees were recovering from all of that stress, um, there was a long dry period, and essentially all along the ridge, the trees died. Now, on the one hand, that's unfortunate to have such a big expanse of trees to die, but fortunately, the Nature Conservancy, the Woods family, Polly Hill, the Land Bank, all essentially decided to leave this grand expanse of forest intact and not do anything. And so if you go out there today, if you look, it's all green as that forest is recovering. So it's a great conservation lesson because nature has phenomenal ability to recover, great resilience and resurgence, but only if we allow it to and only if we keep it intact. Hi, so I have a question. I apologize if you already addressed this. I missed the beginning of your, of your talk, but this is something that I wrestle with a lot because I'm in favor of conservation and I contribute to conservation organizations, but I worry that the more land we conserve and the less that's available for development, housing becomes very expensive. So how do we balance the need for people to live and not all be millionaires with the need for conservation? Yeah. Uh so land area is not the limiting factor for development, and it's probably not going to be the determining factor for the price of real estate. Um, there need to be mechanisms to keep prices affordable, to keep landscapes affordable. In, for example, that vision that I showed for all of New England, built into there is actually the ongoing rate of development continuing out 50 or 100 years. And so even with the most active land development on the vineyard, we wouldn't use up the land. What we need to do is to choose the land very wisely that should be developed and to do that in ways that we can also structure the availability of that land. And that is what is going to accommodate ongoing development. At the same time, we need to recognize that there are limits. Now, at some point, even if you had unbridled development, at some point you're going to run out of Martha's Vineyard. So the question is, do we let nature determine where that end point is, or do we predetermine what we want the end point to be to achieve the kind of Martha's Vineyard that we would like to live on, visit, and enjoy? So I have a similar question earlier. Sure. Um, you showed a slide with the development of a single large houses yeah. in the woodland, ancient woodland and all that. Is there any uh, uh, remedy or any policy from your experience that you can share in this room that uh, how we can efficiently actually encourage people to participate, to contain the development in certain areas? Now, I'm from Vineyard Haven. Our, our town doesn't have a much buildable the space. And now people are, some of the, even the town the residents are even as, asking to develop the 10% of the ancient woodland to create the IHT type of the group housings. And uh, I, and the, so uh, it's different, different from my own like, uh, uh, expectation right. of the conservation, but the, some of us are actually talking about it because uh, the, the need for the housing is real. and. Uh, this is constant uh, kind of like a ratio balance issue. Right. And uh, I, want you, I want to know whether you have experienced this in the other areas and whether you can share your knowledge. So the question is how do we, um, how do we govern where develop, uh, development occurs? How do we conserve these big blocks of land and so on? And really that is a combination of active land protection, which can conserve land intact legally, and zoning. And there's a number of different ways to plan and to zone and to, um, to 
govern where develop, most active development occurs. I show this picture of the island plan because the island plan spent a lot of time talking about that on the island and identified areas where that were preferred for development and preferred for conservation. It then takes the individual towns to make those kinds of decisions. It also takes individual landowners to enter into the decisions about permanent land protection. So really, it, while there at one point was a proposal for a kind of top-down regulatory approach to the vineyard, one of the things that really stimulated conservation and effective planning on the vineyard back in the 70s, now it really has to come from the bottom up, from the landowners and the individual towns making exactly the decisions that you're asking for. No. So I think I think we're going to say that that's, that's all. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to David, who will be available in the signing tent.